Are you ready to detox from toxic detoxes? If that's the case, this is the episode for you. It's about time because we're going there. Hey family, welcome back to another episode of We're Going There. I'm your host, Bianca Wattis Oltoff, and we are continuing on with a five-day Destroying Diet Culture series with Leslie Schilling, author of this amazing book, Feed Yourself. Uh, we've been talking about it and pulling out main key principles as well as just having theological conversations, practical conversations, realistic conversations, traumatic conversations about what diet culture has done to our heart, to our mind, to our bodies, and even our psyche. Now, one of the things I was really excited about because I hail from loving a good detox. I think my first detox was Tyra Banks's lemon juice, salt, cayenne pepper, and I was on it for three days until I passed out and hit the floor. Friends, I am telling myself, somebody out there is listening saying, God, Bianca really has a lot of issues. Yes, friends, that's why I'm in therapy. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to today's topic. We are after the holidays. They're finished, done and dusted. We're excited. But if you're anything like me, whether you come back from vacation or the holidays, we have a lot of what I now know is diet culture conversations around a good detox. Yes, for our podcast families, those were air quotes. For our YouTube family, you will see all of our facial intonations. And yes, it's kind of hilarious because you're getting a sidebar because I communicate with my eyebrows. Bless the Lord. Okay. So after a holiday season or after a vacation, maybe where you find yourself indulging in a lot of carbs, that's not normal or adult beverages. And that hasn't normal or a lot of sweets. And that isn't normal. Your body might feel like you want to take a pause from something. Now I say pause and not detox because after reading this book, Leslie, you made me think differently. So what I want to do in today's conversation is detox from detoxes. Friends, can you please unpack this for our podcast family? Well, detox is a diet culture word. I can tell you like medical literature, um, all of that, like detox is a diet culture word. And it's generally used to promote weight loss, maybe even some type of purity, self-righteousness. Um, <laughs> there, you know, a lot of times we see, um, diet, we see diet culture use detoxes and then that falls into orthorexia, which we haven't talked about. And that's an unhealthy fixation on being healthy. And I see a lot of detoxes and that t those types of practices, in, in that space to that unhealthy fixation on being healthy, which is not a clinical eating disorder, but can very quickly lead to one. Um, so yeah, we, we've got a detox from the detox. Wait, 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 there is a problem with wanting to be healthy. It's a There's mental a disorder. <laughs> well, it is the, um, relentless pursuit of yes, that leads to, that leads to mental and physical illness. Yes. Okay. I just, I just praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit because I don't know how I would live in life with all these, like, I'm healthy. I'm too healthy. I eat too much. I don't eat enough. Like, I feel like this very Britney Spears moment where I'm not yet a girl, not yet a woman moment. And so I'm glad that we get to dive into this conversation. Now for somebody out there who, uh, well, actually I'm just going to speak for myself. There are moments, Leslie, where I am on vacation and I do feel like when I get home, like, golly, I would love broccoli. Cause I'm one of those weird people that love broccoli. So. I would, I would love some greens. I, I have greens every meal. I just enjoy greens. So what's the difference between like wanting to juice or I'll, I'll, I will say I have done a five day juice detox cleanse after the holidays because I felt like, well, a cleanse is good. I have to get all these toxins from the holidays out of my system. What I hear you saying is that it could be good or it's not good. So. Well, the cleanses, like God gave you livers and uh, livers, <laughs> kidneys and a liver to do that. Like God doesn't make junk. Shout like out Shout out to God. Yes. Like God doesn't make junk. Like you have kidneys and you have a liver. Thank you. Stay hydrated. Boom. You did it. You're detoxed. Like your body does it automatically. So it's a marketing term and it's a diet culture term. And when mm -hmm. we have things like the five day, de the five day cleanse and stuff like that, I'm going to be real honest, just like I would in my office with a client. That can be a form of purging, which is disordered eating. So if you're drinking a bunch of juice and you're getting diarrhea, like we're going there um, all the time, you know, like we're like, ooh, that's a cleanse. And, and me as an eating disorder professional is like, ooh, that's purging. So red flag. 
<laughs> you know, so, so red flag there. So detoxing is a slippery slope. And remember, it's a marketing diet culture word. And it usually is like delivering up possibly like you're more pure, you might lose weight, weight, wink. Um, so we have to be really careful with that, particularly this time of year, right? Diet culture Olympics. And we're using the language around the holidays. We ate too much. We did all this thing. Did you know that the average person gains like one pound during the holidays? One pound. Like we're, we're freaking out over just poop the next day. We're going there. Like this is how I talk about this. So, I mean, we're so like, but diet culture has sold us the problem, right? You yeah. were bad and now you got to fix it. So that's diet culture language and the detox does that. And then we, we say we binged, we did all this. There was celebration and feasting in the Bible and nobody ever called that a binge. It was like, we are at the celebration feast. We are celebrating Jesus's birthday. Like my family makes a birthday cake for Jesus. Like, and we're eating it and it is fun, Fetty. So we, I mean, like, it's okay. But to your point of, if I'm coming back from say, holidays where I'm eating things that are different for me, or if I'm eating things where I'm not as hydrated as normal, or I'm off my kind of movement routine, like walking with my neighbor or whatever, or I ate a bunch of things that were just different for me. There's something called interoception, which I hope we all have. It's like, if your bladder's full and you're like, Oh, I got to pee. Like, yay, your body's telling you things like we, we ignore the hunger thing and that's diet culture and we don't want to do that. But that interoception that, gosh, or maybe you're not regular from a bowel perspective or you don't feel so good. There's nothing wrong with kind of like getting back in your groove of your regular eating. What turns possibly disordered, disordered is like, oh, I must do a cleanse or a detox to fix this. And that's really not necessary because, again, God doesn't make junk. And we have these amazing organs that if you stay hydrated, they're going to take care of you. Okay, so I'm going to be the pushback here from a biblical perspective. So uh, it, I, I understand that if detoxing is about weight loss, then that's not the right motivation. Okay, it, it's not the right motivation. Got it. But what about the biblical examples? So we have Samsonite that took a Nazarite vow. I'm sorry, Samson, not Samsonite. That's the luggage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Bible scholar. That's funny. There's some ba there's some baggage there. So <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Um, but what about Samson who took a Nazarite vow and he couldn't cut his hair, he didn't drink alcohol, or the disciples praying and fasting regularly. Um, and that wasn't from TV, that was from food, or Daniel, where he had no um, you know, wine or decadent food at the king's table. So help me understand. What is a healthy way or good way to approach? I don't, again, I'm cautious with the word cleanse, but how do I recalibrate? That's my word. Yeah. How do I recalibrate my internal sense of health? Because I know when I eat better, I feel better. And that yeah. doesn't mean I can't have flaming hot Cheetos. It just means I feel better when I eat better. How do I recalibrate without going crazy to like toxic detoxes? Right. Well, one, we have to be careful with our language, right? So even like you were like earlier, we were talking about diets and you're like our lifestyle and like potato, potato, right? Diet culture just changes all the words for its own purpose. So um, careful with the language. And like, if you're like, I've checked in with myself, like I am increasing my awareness of how my body feels and it doesn't feel great. There's nothing wrong with saying, but you know what does make me feel great? Making sure I'm carrying my water cup with me every day so I stay hydrated. Getting a good breakfast every day so I'm not so hungry at lunch that I eat a whole box of Triscuits. Or, you know, carrying a smoothie with me in the afternoon or a banana so when I get home from work, I, I feel not so ravenous that I, that I end up, you know, eating the whole charcuterie board or whatever. So we have to really just... We have, but first to do that, we have to be okay with eating food. We have to be okay with the knowledge that you need food and you need it regularly and you need it consistently. But back to the biblical examples of not the luggage, but Samson, like you can live without alcohol. You can live without alcohol and be just fine. Okay, fine. You can live without alcohol. You can live with really long hair. Not going to kill you. Um, you know, praying and fasting regularly outside of diet culture, if we can do that safely, great. Um, oh. the, I love the whole um, 
if you read lots of different translations on the Daniel fast, um, or it's not, or Daniel choosing to fast from the wine and the meat of the king's table, one translation says afterwards he looked healthier. Well, I can tell you that word probably wasn't like a super popular word when we're talking about like, cause you look at the new King, if you look at King James version of that, it's, he looked fatter. That's, that's the word used in a positive way. He looked like his fast didn't emaciate him. He looked fatter, better. So it's interesting how like, interesting how the different translations can deliver it maybe even in a way that is diet culture um, through our lens, right? We have that lens, but how do we do that? We listen to these very beautiful bodies, right? Like if I feel tired, I put myself in the bed. Hopefully I don't like binge four more shows on Netflix. Um, so that like listening, being willing to listen and trust your body. That is what diet culture took from us. Trust. Ooh, trust. trust. Okay. No, go finish, please, because it's too good. I mean, trust in a very wise body. You don't need a detox because God gave you kidneys and liver. All you got to do to take care of that body is stay hydrated and fed. Like God doesn't make junk and God does not make things that complicated. I mean, like we are miracles and not math because we're in, we are so intricate. I can't even say that word, but we are so amazing um, and wonderfully made, right? God doesn't make junk. We don't have to micromanage what was already made good and perfect. We just have to feed it and water it like we would our animals and we wouldn't question that. So we have to get back that trust that diet culture stole from us. And then we don't need the words like detoxes and cleanses, but we might feel off from vacation. Maybe we had too much alcohol. Maybe we you know, slept in and didn't eat regularly. Maybe we, our bowels feel a little weird. Well, there's nothing wrong with just saying, gosh, I'm going to get back to regular eating and staying hydrated and let God's very good work do what it was designed to do. This is the perfect place to pivot. I'm going to go a little off because you had said this and it's actually brought so much freedom to me in this season of my life, but you had said to trust your body on what your body needs. And so I've been doing a lot of research on intuitive eating. Yep. And I know it feels silly because it's like intuitive eating. If you're hungry, you feed it. And if you crave it, you know, you, you give yourself that need. And, and it's been phenomenal. I, I, I feel like I have a lot of um, freedom in this. Okay. So one, can you quickly synthesize what is intuitive eating? So that make sure that everyone's on the same page in, in regards to what intuitive eating is. And then I'm just going to pep, pepper rapid mm -hmm. fire questions. So um, intuitive eating is a self-care framework with 10 principles that starts with, um, you know, being aware of diet culture and ends with gentle nutrition on purpose. The authors are Elise Resch and Evelyn Triboli, who lives in your neighborhood. Um, and, and I, she's, I've done supervision with, with them. They're lovely humans. And intuitive eating is really getting back to that body trust. Inner reception is a big part of it. I will say it is wildly popular to take it out of context and make it the um, eat anything you want anytime you want diet, which it is not. Um, so flaming hot Cheetos, if you want them, eat them, have some water nearby, um, eat them, enjoy them, move on. When we're in a head game about how bad they are for us and, and in the spiral and all of that, that's when we when diet culture is like, girl, you shouldn't, you know better. That's when we are like, okay, screw it. I'll have four packs now. So if we get into the place where, listen, the maple cookie is just some carbs, a little bit of fat. And like your body's like, sweet carbs, fat, put it to work, move on. When we can do that, like intuitive eating helps you make peace with food. Like really they're the originals. They're the OGs when it comes to um, like, getting back in touch with your body outside of diet culture, but it's really not only eat when you're hungry. Like, for example, like I knew we were going to be doing our recording and we're recording when I'm generally eating lunch. So I ate preemptively. So I ate for self-care, not necessarily for hunger, because I knew like how weird would it be if my stomach, the dietitian telling you to eat, is like Row! the whole time, right? <laughs> so, so I ate for self-care. And so intuitive eating is a self-care framework that is multifaceted and helps you step out of diet culture to make choices that serve you 
and your values um, the way you see fit. And it's not a hunger fullness diet or a eat everything in the world diet. When we, when we're like that, like diet culture is that so dichotomous, right? We're either on it or off it. And we have to, we have to let all the foods play, play together and, and not make them, you know, one superior and one inferior. If you want the hot Cheetos, eat the hot Cheetos. Don't make it a head game and move on. And then if you want the broccoli at dinner, yay, eat the broccoli at dinner. It's the thing. The thing is like, we can have them all. Okay, I have a question. I'm raising my hand like a good people. I love it. Okay, first of all, we need to get sponsored by Trader Joe's for as much we as do. we are talking we do. about these freaking maple leaf vanilla cream stuffed cookies. And if nobody knows what we're talking about, there's a part of me that feels like uh, it's like Pandora's box. Like I'm not going to advocate for you have it because you probably, if you're anything like me, you won't be able to shut that box, which is my question for you. So in talking about intuitive eating and trusting ourselves and have the flaming on Cheetos and move on. Here's where I get a little stuck because I have bad patterns or actually, let me talk to you about this. Maybe I don't, I don't know what it is. Fix my life. Um, because I have bad patterns and a weird relationship with food. Oh, we started on episode one talking about these maple leaf cookies. And you said, Hey, if I put one in your lunchbox every day, it wouldn't be like that thing that was, that was taboo or bad right. and that you wouldn't necessarily crave it all the time. Right. When does that happen? Because I will say that I've been listening to you in the back of my mind. I'm like, I could have that cookie and it's fine. And then I'm going to not want it or not feel like it's bad or, you know, something I shouldn't have. Well, girl, I've been having cookies every day. Like, I just don't think that that's. And for me and my personality type and addictive in nature, there's a part of me that's just like, is this just licensed to like be indulgent all the time? Like your well, perspective on this framework, because there's going to be someone out there that is wrestling with the same thing. That That is the, the first question. And that's so, yeah, so on point. I will say, here's something you have to remember. We feel that way because we live with a restrictive mindset. We are told we can't be trusted with that cookie. You learn from a young age, something is bad about the cookie or the weight or whatever. Those seeds were planted very, very deep, very, very early, and they're hard to pull but it doesn't mean they can't be pulled. So if your body doesn't know that your food insecurity comes from restriction, it doesn't know the difference between dieting and famine. Oh You're, and, and if you finally give your body the thing that you never had, of course you're going to want to eat the whole box. That doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It means that you've been restricted from this forever. And mm. it's going to take some time. This actually happens when we see children who have suffered food insecurity come into homes that have food readily accessible. We see kids and even adults who have had food insecurity have times where they're eating more of the thing that they couldn't have. And then we do get to a point. When we're like, you know, I want you to have five boxes of maple cookies. Listen, I always have one on backup. You can ask my husband. But like, <laughs> like you, you get to the point where one, it's like you've had enough to know that they're always going to be there. So yeah. diet culture leads us to have this scarcity mindset. And then our very wise bodies are like, oh my gosh, I wanted this. I wanted this. And now I finally have it. And I'm afraid you won't give it to me again. So I'm going to eat them all now. And so we have to move out of diet culture mindset. Oof! listen, it's so funny. When you talk about uh, food insecurity, I just want to make it plain for us uh, who like to live on the lower shelf. You talk about people who are like, I'll, I'll just, I'll give my testimony. Broke and we couldn't afford food. Is that what you're talking about, food insecurity? Yes, it means you do not have enough food to eat regularly. Okay. Great, great. So uh, that's my testimony. And so when I finally could afford Cinnamon Toast Crunch, it was you sit there with the entire box. Yeah. Uh, it's, as you're, as you're saying this, I'm like connecting the dots. And also like, it's so funny. Cause I started this by saying, oh, I've been having cookies every day. The truth is it hasn't been every day, but if they're there, I, this actually happened yesterday. I had dinner and I just wanted something just, just a little bit sweet. So I had something that was just a little bit sweet. And I said, oh, that was perfect. Okay. Wrapped it up and put it away. I didn't feel guilty. Whoa, whoa. I'm making freaking progress here. Okay. I didn't feel <laughs> I guilty. It. I didn't throw away the box because that's also in my nature. I'm like, I bought it, just throw it away. So it's not here. I'm not tempted. I don't feel like I'm demonizing it and yet still allowing myself to have a little something sweet to cap off the night. So yeah. 
I mean, high five for progress. The system is working. Okay. As we, I, I don't want to rush through this. I don't want to rush through this, but um, you had mentioned that we do not all have the same 24 hours. And we talk about food, whether it's broccoli or the maple leaf cookies, uh, so many factors that we, uh, so many factors that are play that we are unaware of when it comes to like digestion, food, 24 hour mm -hmm. cycles, good food, bad food. We talked about this dichotomy. Like we're so close to having all the pieces come together. Can you kind of unpack when we talk about like a good day, I had a good eating day or had a bad eating day and walk us through. Cause when you were, when you and I were talking about this, I felt like this was a game changer for me. Yeah. Well, I could put you on the spot and be like, well, what is a good day? You know, like, but I can tell you. I said I was a guinea pig. You want to know my good day? Yeah. What, what is a good day to you? Okay. Um, so I have, okay. Oh, darn it. So, so I'm just saying pre us talking, pre us talking. What's a good day? Uh, oh yeah. Um, so I don't always eat breakfast. It's just, I'm just, I like to work out. And so I, I don't like to have a big breakfast before. So I don't have a breakfast. I'll usually have lemon water um, and that has ginger in it. And then I go work out and come back. So probably at around like 10 o'clock, I'll have a protein shake and it's a, it's a caloric dense protein shake. So it's vegan protein. It has 40 grams um, in it. I make it with almond milk. I put a little bit of coffee in there. I'll put spinach, uh, chia seeds, almonds, and a little bit of coconut butter, just for some extra fats in there. If not uh, coconut butter, then like half an avocado or something like that. Blend it up and it's so dense and it's so filling. And then um, probably at around like one or two, uh, whatever I have on hand, I, I honestly, it's been a really busy season. So I'll say like yogurt with some fruit and granola, or mm -hmm. I'll do like, um, I just, I just don't have bread and not, this is probably an effective diet culture. I just never have bread in my house. Um, so lunch is like a salad or some protein, like, like, like sandwich meat wraps type of things. Um, I'll do uh, a green juice. I'll do an athletic greens. Uh, maybe I'll have some nuts. And then dinner is a definitely more dense. That's where, and dinner is like my favorite meal. Um, it's it's so communal for me. It's where I have my friends and family over. And so it's it's definitely, I try to have protein in it because I'm trying to eat at least a hundred grams of protein every day. Um, and um, I like vegetables. So there's usually a vegetable and there's always like a starch. That's where I'll allow myself to have the rice or Mm -hmm. whatever. I don't know. Something that just feels, feels filling. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so that feels like a good day. That's my good day. Yeah. Okay. It's All right. a good day. <laughs> but here's the thing and that's fine. But I think I remember when we first went through this, I think I said, okay. And I still think you're under eating. <laughs> so, so usually what a good day means for people is that I adhered in some form or fashion to the rules of diet culture which is like, I was able to restrict in some way. Right. So like, would you out, would you say a day where you had a friend's birthday party and you had a piece of cake and breakfast and the focaccia, I know you love, cause that's all your Thanksgiving posts. Like, um, so, um, if you had that, would you call it a good day? No, I wouldn't. No. Well, actually, actually. Okay. If you were to ask me this a month ago, I would say absolutely. It was a disastrous day. You had carbs, you had sugar, you had cake, you know, you probably toasted with a glass of champagne or something. And now I would say I had a, a celebratory day with my friends and I don't want to walk in guilt. I also yeah. just want to be very mindful that I, I know what my body needs to feel its best. Yeah. And I, I, I don't actually, actually, you know, I'm realizing, I'm realizing I don't feel guilt because that's bad. I feel guilt because my body is, um, it feels better and it treats me better when I treat her well. And totally. that's not food. It's also with movement. And it's also just being gentle with myself, like not talking so much hatred over yeah. my body. So yeah. that's yeah. the shift. Absolutely. And so, and that's like, and I, I pray like we all move towards that type of place where it's like our food decisions are based on, for example, like there are certain foods that when I eat them, like it hurts my stomach. So maybe I eat those less. Right. Um, and that's okay. That's that interception outside of diet culture, that paying attention to your body, really embracing that wisdom. But what diet culture makes us do, it makes us good day, bad day. And it's like, our bodies don't work in 24 hour segments. Like 
it's not 12A to 12, you know, to 12A again and like check you did good or check you did bad. That's very diet culture thinking. Your body Mm -hmm. is like the balance over time, you know? So you had the birthday party, you had the focaccia day, you had, you had, you had things you don't normally have in your day. Well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is where you fed fully over the course of several days. For example, if I forgot my lunch and I was really hungry, I'm a li- I'm underfed today. Like I did not get that meal today. Um, but the next couple of days I might be like, why am I so hungry? You know, or if I had a big workout or a big hike, I'm a big hiker. If I'm a, I had a big hike on this weekend and like Monday I'm super hungry and I'm like, there's no way I didn't work out today. I'm like, well, your body doesn't work that way, but our brains do in diet culture. It makes sense that you're hungry later. You did you, or if you have a high stress day, that's what people think. They're like, well, I didn't work out today. I'm like, well, that doesn't matter. You're still in recovery. You still yeah. have your cortisol went super high because you're super stressed out. That is a big energy load. It's a stress load. All those things impact what we need. So we have to get out of 24 hour thinking because it's, it's a diet culture. It's a diet culture setup for sure. And when we're stuck in that, I think we kind of wanted to talk a little bit too about a lot of that is disordered eating thinking or disordered eating behaviors where we're, you know, on purpose skipping meals. And I'll tell you, like, I like to work out in the morning and I don't like to work out on a full stomach. So I'll like have coffee, have a like a snack and then my workout and then I'll have my breakfast, you know, and that's okay. That's like to each is on. If you're hungry when you get up and you want to have like a couple eggs and a piece of toast, knock yourself out. All good stuff. Um, but staying consistently fed is really important. But when we don't allow ourselves to do that, or we're skipping meals or afraid to eat certain food groups, um, those are disordered eating practices. And I want to tell you, this is something alarming considering like we're not getting any younger and, you know, I, um, like I see so much, so many women my age who are not like in their twenties or thirties that are suffering with eating disorders. And I think the statistic is one in five women um, will suffer with an eating disorder by the time they're 40 years old. And it's because I will tell you, diet culture is getting louder. And it's also telling us not only do you have to be super skinny in this world, you can't age. So best of luck, friend. It's a mess. It's a mess. So it makes sense that we're here and we're questioning everything um, because diet culture is, you know, holding hands with anti-aging culture and hustle culture and all the things. Um, So we have to think about about our good day in that context too. Like, was I gentle with myself? I think the more that we could see diet culture, the more that we could open up our level of awareness to how it has affected our life. And yeah. even in talking to you, and I, I I don't want someone to hear this and be like, okay, well, she's had five conversations with Leslie and now, you know, she's fine freedom. That's that's not what I'm advocating. Right. <clears throat> I do think this is gonna be a long journey for me, but what I will say is that the more that I could see it and the more that I can call it out for what it is, It reminds me of that scene. Now I'm going to date myself, but there's a movie called The Matrix and you have a, you get a choice between the blue pill or the red pill or the green pill, the red pill, something like that. And one, you can live in delusion. um, And the other one is that your eyes are open to reality. And I think that in the work and the research and the scholarship that you have done and the ways that you help people, you are literally saying, open your eyes to what is around you and let's call it for what it is. It is an assault on a Mago day. And this is, you have not said this language. This is me saying this language after reading your book and talking with you, we are made in the image of God. And yet we have culture telling us that you are not good enough. And because you're not good enough, you're not happy enough. And because you're not happy enough, you'll never be loved enough. And it is absolutely disastrous. And what you're doing is you're providing a framework for us when you see it, to call it out and to renounce it. I'm going to, I'm going to use the language, renounce it in the name of Jesus. So when I start falling into the diet culture trap, I want to say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to use food as my enemy. I'm going to walk in wholeness and freedom. And you have, this is where I want to round, round up this episode, but you say 95% of adults, oh, their weight checks are unnecessary. Right. And then you have this quote, you owe no one a number on the scale. That feels a little like you've got some chutzpah in you, kid, because I'm going to, 
I didn't know that I could not step on the scale. Right. Like for me, stepping on the scale, the doctors, like it, it's the scale has been part of my daily practice, like for a really long time that is breaking in the name of Jesus. But it's, that's not a really big deal. But there's a lot of anxiety that people have around that. So when you say you owe no one a number on the scale, I'm a rule follower. If the doctor says step on the scale, it's on the scale. The doctor says, you know, you got to change. You got to do it. When you are giving us this countercultural message against diet culture, what do you mean? And how do we live and own that? Well, I will say it's it's not easy. Like you said, like you're not in day four of this thinking like, okay, I'm it's all better. We all live here and, and we can hold the desire to conform to, to diet culture, like to live in a smaller body because it might in some way be easier for us. We can hold that in one hand and know that we're not going to chase it anymore. There's grief involved. There's time involved. You live in diet culture a long time. So have I. It doesn't mean we're not going to be impacted, but it means that our eyes are wide open. And we're hopefully not going to engage in it and align with it anymore. And we're going to make choices that align with like, I took the pill so I could see what's going on. I can see what's going on. And so when I go to the doctor's office and they're like, let's get your weight and I'm there for a flu shot. I know that's not necessary. I also know that if I get on that scale and it's above a certain number, they can say whatever they want to me about food and exercise or whatever, and they get to bill an extra code to my insurance. So mm. it's there's a lot of money involved in making you think you need to conform. Um, it is infuriating as a healthcare professional who has done a 180 in my own practice because I used to practice that way. So 95% approximately, one of my wonderful physician colleagues is the one who said this to me, and it is in the book, she's like, about 95% of adult weight checks are unnecessary. Listen, if I'm going in for surgery, please weigh me, do not guess. I want the correct anesthesia. Um, if I need to be dosed appropriately for a medication based on my weight, please weigh me. But you could do that in, in where I step on backwards and you don't tell me and you give me what I need without um, causing me harm if knowing the number has harmed me in my life or if I have a history of an eating disorder or disordered eating. So yes, you have every right as a patient to say, I do not give my consent today. I'm happy to talk to my healthcare professional about it. If you need it for my treatment, um, can we do it blind? So you have a lot of options and mm. you do need to know that it's not really necessary. If you're there for a lab sheet, if you're there for a flu shot, if you're there for a cold, if you're there for pink eye, if you're there for diarrhea, <laughs> nobody needs to know your weight for that. We just need to treat it. And I will tell you the litmus test for this too, or, or kind of pr the proof is in the pudding. During COVID, plenty of people got care without stepping on the scale because they did a virtual appointment and you got care anyway. Very true. Listen, on this episode, we are detoxing from toxic practices as a whole, whether that's disordered eating, stepping on the scale of the doctor's office, uh, hey, hey, all, all the other small and subtle nuances that have crept into our mind and thinking and what we've been taught through diet culture. And we're saying not today. No, thank God. Shout out Jesus. Shout out Yahweh for our kidney and our liver. Praise the Lord. Um, but I want everyone to detox a healthy way with water and lemon, stay hydrated, go on a walk, pray, get in community, feed your dang body. As the title of the book says, feed yourself. Uh, if you want more information from Dr. Leslie, any of the conversations we've been had, you can click the link in the show notes and that goes directly to Amazon where you can pick up a book. But Leslie, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your insight. Most importantly, I've been saying this almost every episode. It's your grace, your grace in having a conversation that feels almost as prickly as cactus. You are making it feel kind and loving and simple and most importantly, doable. So tomorrow we wrap up our last day in uh, discovering food freedom and we don't have to have a dysfunctional relationship with food. We are dismantling diet culture with Leslie. And I'm so excited for tomorrow's episode as we wrap up this week. If these episodes have been a gift to you, consider sharing them with your friends. The more podcasts that are out there, the more lives that can be transformed. And that is the point of this. No, we are not sponsored by Trader Joe's, but if anyone knows anyone, 
who can get us a sponsorship for some maple leaf cookies that we will eat in moderation without any guilt and feed ourselves, you can let us know. You can email info at in the name of love.org and we will say we love you. Until tomorrow, friends, uh, enjoy the flaming hot Cheetos in moderation. Feed yourself if you can. We'll catch you tomorrow.